tweet using the hashtag visual future. Uh, Mike and I are both on there as well. I'm Amy Lewis PR. Screw you. Mike. We do. You can figure it out. Oh. Yeah, you can Google PR. It's only that. It's easier. Come on in. Come on in. By the way, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, we have one microphone, so we figured this is easier. Yeah, rather than yeah. Yeah. We both have kids, so there should be no problem in you hearing us. Uh, we can project to the back. So I'll stick on Ahmed, I'll pretend he's my almost 14 year old, and project a little bit strongly if I need to. So just raise, raise your hand. Uh, a couple rules uh, feel free to leave if you get bored or if you need coffee. Uh, if you can figure out the hot water for tea, there's a bonus in it for you because a lot of us can figure it out yet. Uh, and uh, there's a set of stairs, so if you're really if you're interested, you can walk up behind and peer over the side for a secret look at what's on here. So with that, why don't we uh, why don't we dive in? What do you think? Yeah. Okay. So does anybody know what this picture is?
We might give you a prize, okay? But we might also give you a prize. That's it. Or two. Or three. Under, Never but I know everyone's dying to know what's going on. It's under there. You didn't bring yours. If you can find a friend with a pen, write your name on it. Well, just, that's all we need. I do, but then you want to pick one up. That's it. I promise not to spam you. I only spam you before an event like this. You can comment on something. Okay. Uh, so, let's, uh, let's kind of move into the heart of things here. Yeah. So, it's really our hope that you're going to take away one thing. We're going to cover a lot more than you can remember tonight. Uh, it's a lot more than we can always remember. It takes two of us to present this thing. Uh, and we're really just hoping that there's one thing that we can have you walk away with that you'll be able to use in your job or use in your business or use in your hobby um, or just to be able to move along with. So, what you're going forward with. So let's start with, um, this isn't going to be a lot of tactics, right? There's a lot of tactical pieces to visual communications. A lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is strategic, making you think. Um, but to start with, that's some fun. We're going to profile some new technologies, some more recent apps that are really showcasing uh, the power of visual communications. So if you start with this. All it does, and I say all it does, is give you a quick way to make an easy slideshow using your iPhone, photos you took, and audio already on your phone or your tablet. Um, it seems simple, that's the premise, right? Amy made that, what, three minutes? Maybe. Yesterday? On the couch while talking to my mother. Is it? <laughs> uh, and that's the goal. Visual communication doesn't have to be complex, right? You can make something very simple. Uh, very easy with a lot of technology uh, that's out there today. And it's free. And it's free. Also, helps. Um, two, this is a technology, an app that we've seen, a platform. Uh, by the way, some of these are going to die. Some of these are going to be acquired. Some of them will survive. Uh, we don't make any predictions. Um, but for uh, you know, looking at uh, potential, Beamit is meant to be a photo-centric messaging platform. So how many of you text messaging on a regular basis? Right? iMessage, etc. It's still copy based, right? What comes up? It's a line for text. Beamit is all centered around the photo and using the photo as a visual means. Um, it's also meant to send photos to archive photos in a high res format. Remember the days of Ophoto? I will say that from the Rochester days. There was Ophoto, there was a Kodak gallery. We had Kodak acquired Ophoto and then broke it. Uh, but this is meant to be almost a resurrection of the Ophoto world. Uh, but in a messaging platform. Try it, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to survive or not, but, uh, but it's been a good try. How many of you would admit to using Tinder? Nobody ever does. Emily does? <laughs> right? Okay. Use it now. Wow. <laughs> hey, stop right swiping over there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, then compress them uh, 
um, and play them back in a way that lets you see the world around you, maybe something that would transport over 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, into a very tight time frame. Right? It's traditional time-lapse photography. Well, they've done those, put technology into it, take shaking out. Right? So it actually looks professional. It's giving professional tools to the amateur to use visuals in a new way. In fact, I'll show you a couple of examples here. I think I was sitting with O'Hare uh, taxi no, on that one over here on uh, your left. It's a sushi bar in California. Uh, it was fun, right? But that, I never knew that um, time from taxi to take off over there was, any idea how long that took in real time? 15 minutes. I never timed my taxi over here and I never will again. In fact, I got bored. I'm like, oh my gosh. Stop. Uh, but if you think about the applications, how you compress time through a visual mechanism. That's also a theme you're going to hear a lot about tonight is time. And then there's rounds. Uh, rounds is meant to be uh, a ne the next big visual app. Um, there's a, another similar app like it in Japan that's taking off. It's meant to take face-to-face uh, -face communications. Um, Skype. They may use Skype for business or a link. Um, or any video chat technology and make it personal. So now you can connect with a friend. Let's say, uh, Lisa, you had it on your phone. You and I can talk to each other in real time. Sure, you can do that today. We can also call a web page up and actually both correspond about the web page, draw the page, interact almost in a whiteboard technology. It's a lot of what you find in business communications tools being brought over uh, to, uh, to the consumer world. Again, early on, will it live? My question is, there's some limitations, but um, I like the contract. So then, what we want to get into is the foundation of visual storytelling. Because right? that's how you use visuals. They're used to tell a story, they're not a one-off. They're used to create a narrative. Um, what is this on the screen? Bacon, egg, and cheese. A heart attack. <laughs> Bacon, egg, and cheese. You're both right. So, Amish, which was a heart attack. Right, it's OK. So, Amish from the American Heart Association. He's cleared all of our slides. Uh, that's why we're not serving him for that. We have cauliflower and broccoli. Uh, what's interesting is um, Nathan Burgold, who was at Microsoft and then left to become really a noted uh, chef and almost student of food, uh, had this quote up here. And I will not pretend I'm a creative director and read it to you. Uh, but essentially, what you want is you want your visuals to leave something to be desired. You want to make people work just a little bit to try to figure out what it is because it's going to draw them into the story. You know, when that flashed up, it took you a second to figure it out, maybe a millisecond, but you still took it a little longer to make you be kind of inquisitive about what that was. That's what you want to do with your visuals. You need a little bit of mystery there. Now I'm hungry as well. Um, so along those lines, uh, this is a photograph from one of the first grade graduating classes at the Harley School. We've been around since 1917. And this is the last graduating class. And it just shows you the power of photography, <coughs> uh, photos and how they can stand the test of time, how it doesn't have to be new. It doesn't always have to be something current or something that has happened um, just yesterday. But there's a power in photos that can pass the test of time, which brings us passing the test of time. Uh, will your visual, the, the visual that you've chosen, the image that you're looking for, will be compelling in 20 years, 30 years, uh, even five years from now? What Mike was talking about, things that stick around, will it be able to do that uh, in time? We used to joke at Kodak. But anyway, anybody here, former Kodak employee? Okay, right? So, now, when you were a Kodak, we had color photos on our business cards, right? Every Kodakian has a business card. What's that? Unless you printed your own. Unless you printed your own, right? You had the color photo half, you know, half was your detail. You, every now and then you get a tradition of somebody who refused to update their photo. Still black and white, shot 78. You know, he had that 78 mustache going on. He was young. Um, that photo did not stand the test of time. So truly, though, think. Think about the photos you use. And you know, are they compelling? Not only a year from now, the photo you're putting on social media um, next week. What will that say? Will it still be relevant? Maybe it doesn't need to be, but keep that in the back of your mind. We won't get too much into the science. My friends here know I'm a little bit of a science nerd, um, but there is a system called the reticular activating system that governs what the human brain is interested in. Uh, 
Um, as I said, this is the science of the art. This is why I have a bachelor's of science in communication, as opposed to a BA. So I told my mom. At least she believed me. Uh, so I'm a PR. And uh, what the RAS does is give you a few different mechanisms that triggers the brain to take note of things. So there's novelty, right? How many times have you seen a photo because it stops you in your tracks because it's you know, something you haven't seen before? It's novelty. Contrast. Remember those late night TV ads that shows the guy who lost 400 pounds, the before and the after? And then there's the mouse type above, right? Which is also not typical. But that's contrast. You stopped and you watched. Emotion. Um, people here today, is anybody on Facebook? That little platform, you know, that's taken over the world? Right? How many puppies do you like today? Kittens, rainbows, right? Kittens, yeah, it's emotion. There's the emotional piece of it. Uh, patterns as well. Um, patterns will make you stop and think, or a break in that pattern um, as well. An uh, example, obviously. And then speed. Um, things are moving very quickly, fast. Um, that'll make you trigger the brain to actually try to stop them and figure them out. So think about how you build those into a photo. Um, you can even put a checklist together as you're looking at the visuals. And it's not just photos, it's motion video too. To say, does it hit one of those? If it doesn't hit one of those, maybe there's something better. Uh, but ask yourself that question. So, let's give you 10 trends, okay? 10 big trends in visual communication. Before we, before we do that, where's the bucket? The bucket of the bucket of fun. Look at that. What do we have in here? We have post-it notes. Oh, I'm going to mine it. Oh, okay. You never got that correct. We're one back, okay? There we go. You never got passed over here? No. Oh, okay. Oh, you missed the road. Oh, this is like a church. This is great. You can call it Catholic. Um, okay, I take five. Tens are good. Anybody else? Front row. Okay, we will wait. We'll put it right here. I was in China for Easter Sunday, and we went to we, the desk that to a church. Uh, so we go, and I was with my boss at the time. We're like halfway into the service. He's like, do you think it's a Catholic Mass? I'm like, I don't know. Right? And, like, and then they passed the collection Mass. We're like, oh, we're good. <laughs> so, it's my qualifier if I don't open the right place. So, we have more coming in. Do you want to pick one out there, I think? I do. Just for fun and excitement? Don't worry, we will not. No. What do we got? Lisa Barron. Lisa Barron? Oh. Oh. No, no, it's all, it's all good. Let's give you something, Lisa, just for fun. Okay. How about a shirt? Um, what's up with a neck? A neck? <laughs> Besides a shirt. Besides a shirt. Wait, okay, we we're putting one aside for it. That's okay. We are putting, you. We are putting, so. I'm teasing. No, no, you're not teasing. See? <laughs> Okay, look what we're doing, Lisa. And then we looked on a couple others that have large screens. And it wasn't responsive. 
very, very recently, uh, Ride Country <coughs> has implemented a new mobile site that is more responsive, although their homepage on their website is still, you know, it is not. Um, another example, though, as we're looking along, Murray, another independent school. Um, again, great use of photos, shows you what's going on, very active page at the school, stretches the entire page, and when we looked on other platforms, it maintained those large photos. So even as our devices continue to fluctuate in size, they all went really small, now they're going back big. We don't know where they will exactly land. And there are many choices. You can see that with a responsive page, you're able to fill the screen either way, so you get the maximum use out of that device. Do you know what happened when we got, did anybody have an iPhone 6? How about a Nexus or a, a you know, Samsung? <laughs> Large phablet, right? I get the term mm -hmm. phablet, right? Uh, how about a six plus? Does anybody have this giant? You do, okay. Does. Julie does, <laughs> right? It's massive, right? Um, <coughs> do you know what the ramifications of larger phones are? What other industry <coughs> that was affected by phones becoming larger? Any idea? Fashion. Fashion and clothing. Um, you saw that, right? As soon as the six came out? I said I couldn't get a six, it won't fit in my pocket. The next thing I knew, um, um, American Eagle is now redesigning their jeans line to have larger pockets on the female pants because you can't put it in there. Now I don't think Julie's is going to fit in there no matter what, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but they're moving in that direction. It certainly has an impact. So, a uh, second big trend, authenticity. That's the uh, coin of the realm, really, <coughs> communications in general these days. Uh, but the more we communicate visually, it's a very truthful platform, the platform that there's an expectation of what you see is what you get. Uh, now in the journalism industry, you have a number of people uh, that are decrying the use of Photoshop, right? You need to touch up the clouds or a little contrast, remove a blemish or a speck of dust. Um, you see, you've seen AP photographers uh, fire, um, actually have you know, career limiting moves uh, because they've touched up their photos um, in, a, in a bit of a, of a way. Um, you have to do the same thing or take that into account um, as you're using photos, as you're using visuals in your own communications. Keep them authentic. The only time you don't have to do that is if you're selling genuine fake watches. <laughs> How many of you are wearing fake watches tonight? Fake watches. <laughs> You're allowed to bring home two, I learned from the US Customs agent I spoke with. Um, and he was serious, so I did bring home two. Uh, so there is a, uh, oh, actually a wonderful uh, report that if you want a copy of it, I can, I can send it along, uh, but from the Arthur Page uh, Society that I'm a member of. Um, and it's around authenticity of the enterprise. Uh, and I did say, they said it's the coin of the realm, right? And, Arthur Page has published quite a bit on the move towards authentic communications. Um, the beautiful thing about communication from a visual sense is if you're doing it in a way that is truthful, um, the response of your audience is also uh, going to be there. Um, there's only so much you can fake in a photo. There's only so much you can fake in a video. Um, use it to show your series. Um, we don't have it in here, but when the CEO, of, I believe it was, um, it wasn't Virgin, uh, it was one of the British, actually it was the British Airways. Uh, they had a, a strike by airline attendants, and the union had caught out to say, you know what, nobody's flying to uh, Heathrow. What did he do? He brought his team into Heathrow and shot video of VA planes taking off, the people boarding. And they put that up online and said, look, they can say all they want, I'm showing you. We're flying right now. Um, and that is effective, right? So it's not just words, it's bringing those visions. So I'm going to talk over this. Uh, part of authenticity is also bringing in the visual experiences of your audiences, of your customers. Did anybody own a GoPro camera? Yeah, a couple heads. Anybody want to own a GoPro camera? I look at Emily. Emily's like begging for a GoPro. Why won't we be off or something, right? Um, GoPro will take videos from their customers once a day and run them. Um, and use them as a testament to the power of GoPro and what it does. You know, it's very much like Kodak, photo of the day. Um, just bringing it back on uh, a different platform. And it's just gorgeous. Some organizations have really been smart about how they've used this, uh, used authentic photos. In one case, there's an example of Momondo, which is a travel and tourism site. They promote travel and inspire uh, folks to 
to, to travel all over, whether it's local travel or international. And one of the things they've done is on Instagram, they have had this great campaign. So first you can, uh, they hashtag with Twitter and everything, win a GoPro, gave one out, they got them some publicity, got them some followers. And then uh, they have people, all of their fans, focus on different themes and win contests where they're featured. And then they're featuring all of those beautiful photos and they've made no investment in this travel on, on their own. It's completely sharing a fan-based, you know, user-oriented uh, photos just from everyone across the world. <coughs> Getting, getting a great group of followers from them. So we're going to talk a little next, number three, about consumption, uh, how people consume media. The first thing that is very interesting is to talk about attention span. And I'm glad that you guys all still look engaged because when I read my attention, uh, read the data on attention span, I think, oh my gosh, no one's going to sit through this presentation. <laughs> so um, in 2000, the average attention span was about 12 seconds. That's how long we could. It. In 2013, it dropped down to eight seconds. And this is adults of all ages. And the sad, sad fact is that goldfish is right around the line. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have people for very long. We know that. You know, we're all using social media. We're all engaged in conversations and working and busy throughout the day. And you know, if you're at a red light too long, you just might check your phone and see if we got that text or an email or you know, it, it might lead to a lot of bad ideas and bad choices, uh, but we are constantly moving, we are constantly multitasking, we are constantly thinking about eight different things at once, so it's really no surprise that our attention span has led to jumping around for a bit. So, how do you capitalize on it? Um, if you're a GE, you create the Second Science Fair. Uh, there was a, another platform, a visual platform called Vine, which just allows six second videos. And GE said, you know what? I thought we could teach a lot of science in six seconds. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple. These are all submitted from students uh, and adults around the world to say, what can you show in six seconds? Uh, solar your visions. <laughs> Storylines are reemerging. Okay, so trend number four. Who likes a good story? Anybody? 
Favorite stories in the room? TV shows, books, movies. All right, give me one. What's the what's your what's the your most favorite story of all time? <coughs> Oh, the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Secret from the Back, a Netflix series. You love Kimmy? <laughs> See, we're going to go with Kimmy then, all right? Okay. Yeah, watch Kimmy Schmidt, you should. Uh, the storylines are re-emerging. Um, how to use the power of photography to tell not just a snapshot in time, uh, but to create an entire narrative. Now, the funny thing is, photography, graphics, images have always been used to tell stories. And in fact, in ways that I think we forget. Um, infographics, right, are all around us. It used to be that little USA Today snapshot that was so amazing, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s. This is an infographic from 1861. It's Napoleon's mar March on Moscow. Um, now, this is believed to be the first infographic in the world, uh, but we got an older one, so I think Amy gets credit for this. Uh, this is Florence Nightingale back in 1857. Diagramming the causes of morality in the Army of the East. Fascinating, but you know what? It works. Um, it's been with us. It's nothing new. In fact, a lot of our visual communications strategies we're going to share tonight are built on principles that have been with us over time. It's just applying them in a new form. A lot of it's digital today, a lot of it was analog, a lot of it's more in a time compressed manner, but the concepts themselves uh, take root in a lot of what we've done you know, over the decades. One of the great things about this too, you take it for graphics and they can be shared, they can be borrowed. You don't have to create them all on your own. In fact, these are some examples that we use here at Harley with some of the word and national organizations. We work with the Ocean Conservancy to do uh, some of their, they cast out different sites, uh, some information so that you can do cleanup. <coughs> we participate here with Lake Ontario and they provide on their website all of these different infographics that we are able to share on Facebook help get the word up, out about the impact that we're having. We don't have to create them all on our own. And, and there's a ton of them out there. So it seems overwhelming to start from scratch to put the information together. But you don't always have to do that. There's a lot of models. So this is just a different example. Um, it's something I'm hoping that I can meet Michael Anderson as we've used him for a while. But this is a, an example of a resume as an infographic. And what an interesting concept. Imagine this if you're hiring from your that you can learn things about his skills and where he's worked and, and all of that. But what I love is down here at the bottom, he has his daily intake and output of coffee, from focus, communication. So you can learn that he's not really a morning person. He needs a lot of coffee. He doesn't wake up chatty. He doesn't really want to talk first thing in the morning. Um, but his humor, around 2 in the afternoon, it is at its peak. And so it's just an interesting way to learn more about this potential Also, you learn that he wakes up at 8 a.m. So, interesting. Uh, <laughs> um, now, it's not that to be infographics that you have to be a designer to put together. Um, you can also use data visualization. Uh, this is something that's actually just in this week's uh, issue of Business Week, Bloomberg Business Week. It's taking a look at the four speeches announcing the candidacy of four presidential uh, candidates. Right? Who do we have? Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Hillary, and Mark Rubio. <coughs> Looking at the extent of their speeches and then color coding them for content to show you what matters most to them. Uh, really interesting. Uh, the yellow is talking about their parents. So, you know, Mark, Ted started with his parents and he forgot about them. You know, Marco's got them there a couple of times. Hillary didn't have time to talk about her parents at all. Uh, God is in there. America. Uh, the blue. I is every time they use the word I, which I found interesting. And I'm not even speaking of my apologies. Rand Paul used the word I 88 times. Um, small things that you may not notice until they're presented in a manner like this. Um, and it's, I say it's relatively easy to do. We've actually done this for our clients. Uh, we had a, a round table of doctors uh, for about an hour and a half in the UK a few months ago. And we went through and just color coded based on topic and content. And it suddenly became clear what they were passionate about, as opposed to just trying to read it again and again. Um, 
There's a great New York Times article, too, on using data visualization for the sciences in the medical industry. Uh, if you want a copy of that, let me know. Uh, but a lot of work's going on here. And this is fun, too. So think about infographics not only in the static sense. How do you apply motion to infographics? How do you tell the story through a sense of motion and time? This is how long it would take to get to the moon. Seems like a long time, right? Lights are still on, I know this, right? Yeah. Lights are okay, we'll keep the lights up. You can see, okay. You're not seeing the great stars, just pretend there's lots of stars on the screen, okay? Um, so if you were traveling at three times the speed of light, or this is to Mars, I should say, to Mars, um, this gives you some sense that it takes a long, 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 long time to get there. You're gonna shut the whole building down. Well, I'm trying not to. There's going to be a student who's having a bicycle downstairs next to the more power this place. Right? <laughs> you know, it's still going, right? Look at that. Right now, aren't you already getting bored? Right? This is bringing the sense of time. I think about time compression. It's going the other direction in making you understand how long this will take. Um, it's going to be about 60 seconds if you were traveling at three times the speed of light to reach Mars. Um, it gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what it will be in just how, how much time it's going to take. So, now we can start to say some of the other topics. Those first four, strategically, foundationally, face it. Now we're going to start to poke and probe a little bit, make it a little uncomfortable, which is more fun. Um, the ephemeral. How many of you have heard of Snapchat? How many of you use Snapchat? How many of you are admitting to using Snapchat? <laughs> um, Snapchat mainstream. You know, if I'd ask this question, I have asked this question a year, year and a half ago, people would go, oh, I don't want to talk about that. My kids have it. You know, Snapchat is certainly the answer. Um, let me tell you why. The ephemeral, what comes and goes, um, is becoming how we live our lives. Right? If I'd asked you 15 years ago, what did you do today? Oh, I did this, I saw this person, I did that. Did you document it all with your film camera and take a picture of everybody and wrote down every place you went and took selfies? No, I just lived the life. This is taking life back in the digital realm with some documentation. So what you're seeing is Snapchat. Snapchat, you can send a photo or a video, it disappears in anywhere from 10 seconds or under, unless you start to create some stories that will disappear in 24 hours. Kick, has anybody heard of the Kick platform? Kick is huge among teens. Uh, my 11 year old has Kick, uh, which I kick him off of on a regular basis. Uh, Kick is a messaging platform where your messages can go in, go out, disappear. Uh, and apparently there's a lot of 3 a.m. chatter on Kick as well. I can help my kids. Uh, slingshot, up here, this little guy. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, Lisa has. Who brought Slingshot out? You know who's behind it? It's Facebook's attempt at being Snapchat. It's failed miserably. Uh, they tried something different, but they're trying. So what, what it tells me is you're going to see other major platforms bring the ephemeral in, bring this here today, gone in the next second. Yik Yak. <laughs> Have you ever heard about Yik Yak? Bullying cases, it's all anonymous posts. Um, if you try to use Yik Yak right here, right now, could you? It's blocked. It's blocked. So why do they block it? It's school. Your school. They block it in school, uh, geographic zones around schools. Not colleges. Yeah, not colleges. Okay. Um, they just added photography on a beta um, uh, basis a few weeks ago as well. So again, you can send a photo and it will disappear. <coughs> Wicker, W-I-C-K-R, is the latest. Um, that's encrypted uh, communication. Uh, I'm sure the NSA folks aren't very happy with us right now. Uh, not with us, but with Wicker. Um, that's also, you can set up any of your messages to self-destruct in a matter of seconds to a day and a half. Uh, and then CryptoCat, which is the most bizarre name for a product I've seen in a long time. You have to set up a conversation name, but you go in and have a conversation, and then the whole conversation disappears. Um, there's no record of it. Um, it's like you met somebody in the parking lot, had a conversation, and never saw that person again. Um, why this is big is it's going to be commercialized. It's going to be used in your everyday communication. We have to become comfortable with it. Um, I love this headline. This is from a couple of weeks ago. It's Hillary's Snapchat defense. All right, what did she do? She was using her own emails. She deleted her emails. She deleted the ones she thought we didn't need to see. 
Um, but I love the quote here from, uh, from Michael Wolf, which is, big fortunes are now being built on the promise of separating what we want to say from what we want people to know we've said. And that is what's behind this ephemeral movement. Right? There's a lot, even in day-to-day conversations, I don't want my conversations being recorded for all time. Um, I will use uh, Snapchat, or I'll use a wicker to send a quick message back and forth, and that's gone. Um, if you look, did anybody see the, uh, the latest uh, WikiLeaks uh, treasure trove of so many emails that came out earlier this week? Okay, did you know there's a Rochester? <coughs> Has anybody heard about that? Uh, Jeff Clark, the new CEO of Kodak, his emails are in there to so many executives trying to get them to continue to buy film. So that's in there. Do you think he wants to see that come out? No, I bet he wish he used Snapchat. Um, he, he wouldn't, but you know what? It's going to come. And now I'm going to show you how. Uh, one second, after this one. Uh, so, Snapchat, if you're a Snapchat user, there's also a monetization of the platform. Um, it's a, new, it's, a, it's a new service on Snapchat called Discover, which is you can get your news, you can get your information by just swiping again. And now all of these content providers are developing content for the Snapchat platform. So, Emily, when we watch the Vice channel to talk to a client in Buffalo, where do we watch it on? On your phone. On your phone. And you watch it on here, down in the corner. Vice. Um, CNN, right? I showed this to one of the GMs from one of the local uh, television stations, and he just shrugged. I mean, this is the way that uh, content, video content is moving to platforms like this. So if you think Snapchat, if you think some of these fly-by-night uh, platforms don't have a life, they absolutely do. Uh, by the way, I think it's, um, how many Snapchat users are there? 300, 400 million right now? Uh, I'm growing, I could be dead wrong on that, but it sounds good, so we're going to go with that. <laughs> um, so, here's what tells you also the ephemeral is here to stay. Facebook quietly put it into beta, where you could have your messages disappear automatically over a period of time. Um, if you are a Wicker user, remember I showed you that Wicker thing back there earlier? There's a WTF function which doesn't mean what you think it means. It means like wicker or something function. Um, that if you use that, it'll post to your Facebook account, only to your friends, or like, who are also your wicker friends, your non-wicker friends will see a picture of a kitten. It's bizarre. <laughs> it's absolutely bizarre. But it's letting you share on your terms. And again, share it away to those go away. Um, Tim Cook, how many of you have an Apple device? Okay. How many of you know that you can make your messages on your Apple device disappear? It's hidden deep in the operating system for iOS 8. Your audio messages, you can have them expire. Uh, and we'll come back to life. Your video messages, same thing. You can have them expire. Um, Apple's playing with it. You're going to see it across the board. I think in the next couple of years, uh, an ephemeral messaging uh, standard will be expected by a generation coming up through, uh, as opposed to being nice to have. Now here's how you can also tell what ephemeral technologies, what visual technologies are here to stay. There's one thing that connects all of these. Uh, the time for the larger, the VHS tape, the Polaroid, the instant, or the Polaroid camera, the instant photo. Or again, remember Rochester Law always had the Kodak one until they lost the lawsuit, patent suit, you know, had to give it back. Uh, you know, even the digital camera. Uh, what fueled the growth of these visual platforms was one thing. Anybody want to guess what it was? It's a taboo subject, and I can't, I have to talk to it because we're at school today, it reminds me. It's the adult industry. The adult industry fueled visual technology advancement, uh, especially with VHS and photography. Uh, and we've heard a lot in the past, even with Kick, with Snapchat, you know, these are all used for kids. It's, it's sexting, it's sending photos they shouldn't be sending. Yeah, it started that way, but look where it's moved. Now you have CNN on a platform that was used for sexting. Uh, six months earlier. Um, actually, I look at this as a signal, usually for new technology or something about to take off. The adult industry, oddly enough, is an early adopter uh, of the facts. Um, I know, it's, it's bizarre, it is absolutely bizarre, uh, but it's one of those things from a trend spotting perspective that you tend to look at and, and see what you can do. Mike and I first talked about, we, we had a presentation back at a case conference in February of last year, and when he mentioned one person out of 300 would admit to it. Everyone was like, oh my goodness, and, and people were saying, you know, we'd say, right, you've heard of it, what have you heard? And they're all saying, oh, all the teenagers. You know, and everybody can put their hands over their faces as they talk about it. But it really has become such a change in a year that now a lot of people either have it or they've 
part of it, and they're talking to, you know, Lisa, I know you talk to your daughter about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so it's completely different. And again, how can you make money off of this? Well, there's that whole Discover site, but there's also other organizations. You know, Business Week will um, send out to people previews of covers that are upcoming. If you're back into Business Week, which you can wait until next week. Um, Juicy Couture, they'll give you behind the scenes tours if you follow them. Um, on Snapchat, 16 Candles is a yogurt company. You can get coupons, sign off, special deals, just as you would as you used to sign up for email as your favorite department store or whatever it might be. Um, and Taco Bell is a big one. And an early adopter, even last year when it was still used only with teenagers, Taco Bell was giving out not only just silly, funny pictures, um, but lots of different incentives to come in and all of their new promotions and all the new uh, menu items. So, number six. Sharing is also shifting power. Um, used to be you had control of something. You had power when it was yours, when you held the cards. Now, the more you share, the more power you have. Um, you notice on Facebook, if you those of you who use it, uh, what pops up in your wall, what pops in your feed. You know, the more you share, the more people like what you share, the more power you have, uh, the more influence you have. Um, and photo sharing and video sharing obviously is part of that. So we're going to give you a little bit of background here on uh, some trends we've seen. So what is around influence itself? Um, does anybody know what uh, clout is? K-L-O-U-T? What's that? Yeah, it's like, it's like your power on social media. It's a number. It's a number. It's a score. Do you know what your clout score is? I don't care. You don't care. <laughs> we can look it up right now. No, no. Uh, does anybody know what the cloud score is? Lisa, what's your cloud score? A couple weeks ago, it was like 110 or 112. 110 or 112. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So Lisa is highly influential, by the way. But that's only because you can pull them out of the numbers. Now, originally, you go on Twitter, right? It is. It is very inclusive. Uh, it's meant to give you somewhat of a, a relative ranking of your influence. Um, and what, what Lisa just said is important, right? Initially, it was only Facebook and Twitter. Um, now it is Instagram, right? The photos, your visual sharing matters. Now you say, okay, what does it matter except for personal pride, what my cloud score is? Um, one of the major airlines uh, uses cloud score um, as you call for customer service. If you're in their system, they will get your cloud score. So you don't give a higher cloud score, you may be more apt to say something positive or negative. And you actually may get bumped above somebody else in the queue based on your cloud score. Um, it's that, that is what you see as influence. And that's clout, and you can game the system, uh, but there's other ways of influence scoring as well. Uh, but so don't discount the power of photos uh, in your personal influence, or actually your brand's influence as well. Here's just an example that we found. Uh, Paramount Schools was doing was setting up for the Centennial campaign, and one of the things they did is they asked their alumni, parents, friends to post photos on their website and just have a quick caption. Uh, when we checked in, they just recently finished the campaign, but they had 100,000 photos and were continuing to have more and more. And again, it's that idea of people sharing their own stories. It doesn't really cost them once they set up the infrastructure and have this in place. It doesn't really cost them anything other than someone to monitor it to make sure there's not something indecent being posted. But otherwise, especially within a closed group like that, you're going to have a lot of opportunities that you can have others tell the story for you. So here's just a, a little, some more statistics thinking about those emerging platforms and technologies and social media apps that are, that are moving us forward. Pinterest has been growing and growing. And we have just a couple, a little bit different information here. How many of you are on Pinterest? I struggled with it at first because I thought, I don't really want to do it myself closet. What's on here? You know, and it's really, um, there's so much information. I thought, what purpose could Harley have for being on Pinterest? Is there any at all? And, and if you get into it, there's more than just how to make a million meals in your freezer, which I've done, and how to paint your kid's room and set it up and organize, and all of those kind of tips that they offer. Um, there's a lot of other information, and in fact, we find at Harley with Pinterest, we're able to promote some of those in-classroom activities that could be done at home. It's a really good one for us, and we find a lot of our teachers just naturally are on Pinterest. 
interest. So they, we follow them on their boards and we want to share some math fun that they can do or some snacks that they, healthy snacks they make for kids and things like that. But, but we were interested in how successful Pinterest is going to be because it's hard to invest a lot of time in something if it's not going to stick around and be useful for your audience. And we found that 64% six, <laughs> of kids are on Facebook, but as you can see over here, Pinterest was growing while Facebook was dropping. But then as Mike is going to the next slide, we looked again in the next quarter and we started to change. So they've really been going back and forth, but it does look like it's in the game to stay. Um, Facebook, there's been lots of talk about whether or not it's going to stick around and how many people are on it. It's hard to say it would go away quickly. Uh, and Pinterest has gone up and down in, in growth. And then we've got some more information on that one. See, I might have lost attention. It was that 12 second thing, but I think there's a the other thing is just platform basis. Um, and this, was, this has some relation to visual, but it's um, also just interesting in general. You're seeing your social platforms segment themselves out uh, based on the types of content being shared. So Facebook, uh, heavier in health, news, and science. Um, you look at Pinterest, beauty and fitness, food and drink. Um, and then on the Twitter side, you know things that move fast, especially sports, right? It's real time. Uh, Scoring goal. How many times any Sabres fans in the room, uh, or other hockey fans, baseball fans? Hockey play-by-play -play on Twitter is really interesting to follow. I don't, but it appears in my feed now and then. Um, you know, there are fans who just follow games on Twitter now. Now, speaking of that, in real time, do you think the NHL loves that somebody's tweeting play-by-play? -play? It probably violates all sorts of media usage policies. They're unable to really do anything about it. Uh, but give me a few slides from now. I'm going to show you what else they've tried to ban in the past 24 hours and have had no way doing. I just want to show a couple of examples that are really great on Pinterest. This one is Middle Sisters Wine. Lisa, you have Middle Sisters Wine. <laughs> this is what we gave away, and there might be another bottle over there somewhere. Um, they have Pinterest boards, and instead of saying, hey, here's our new wine that's out, and you know, this is if you're not familiar with it, it's, I don't know, under 10 bucks. It's not expensive wine. And, um, Instead of promoting the latest product and the latest kind, they have these boards where you could pick Smarty Pants' sister, who under, when you link into her, click on her, you can learn about her hairstyles, you can learn about her habits, you might find her Spotify playlist down there. All of the different personalities are broken out. And oh, by the way, you might like her wine, which is called this, which is this kind. And, and so it's just a much more creative, visual, interesting way all of those interests that you have to somebody, yeah, I don't know who you have. I have forever cool. <laughs> <laughs> I have mischief man. <laughs> I don't know if any of this. So another, another example is at uh, James Madison University. They have this, and they run their entire Pinterest site that's done by students, which I think is kind of genius. Um, instead of offering traditional recipes or, you know, how to put a closet in your dorm room, they make it kind of interesting. We have this one board called Beyond Brown, and, and it's all different things that you could make like on a hot pot or in a microwave in your dorm room. <laughs> different recipes, and, and they have other ones that are um, Beyond Purple or, or something like that, and it has where you can find in town um, purple, their school colors, purple shoes and purple hair attachments and all different kinds of things that would be related. Creative way to do it. I think we should, is there, are there any middle sisters in the crowd here? Who's a middle sister? Wow, lots of middle sisters. Which middle sister can show me a photo first? Photo, yeah, who's got a photo? Oh, it's a race, it's a race. Sister or me? If you're a middle sister, I, any photo. <laughs> any photo, you got a photo, it's a race, who's quick? Hold it up, oh! oh so, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Technically, so you get a bottle of middle sister smarty pants because you realize you didn't have to get up and you just showed it, okay? We'll give you a dry picture of you in exchange for your photography. Don't worry, there's more fun and excitement surprises. Amy has cash. Um, so, time limits. Time limits to driving value. So this gets down to that time compression piece, right? Um, what's this? Isn't it amazing that in a room this size, that many people know about an ice bucket challenge? That we My seven-year-old was up here earlier and saw the slide. He goes, is that that ice bucket thing everybody was doing on Facebook? <laughs> yeah. So how, 
Was that, or how long ago was that? Summer. Last summer, right? Um, and it was the hot thing, right? Or cold thing, I should say. Um, and then it quickly fell, not fell out of favor, but it had its time. So that's not timely today. I put an ice bucket challenge out on my Facebook page today, or sent you an email. You look at me like I was crazy. Maybe I'm like, wow, you're living in 2014? Um, apparently I was earlier in the week, so I ate it to two documents 2014, and somebody noticed and changed them in my office. Uh, but things have an expiration date. Even this, right? Now, I purposely stood over here so Amy could be left shot. Um, yeah. Nice, we were going to use the outfit. Um, but, uh, you know, left shark was hot for all of what? A week? Week and a half? The time of your value. You could buy a left shark t shirt that night and have it shipped to your house the next day. Right? It was visual. That was Super Bowl. It was, for those of you who don't know, Left Shark was during the Katy Perry halftime performance. Left Shark really didn't keep up with choreography. <laughs> and, it was all big, and it became a big uh, meme. Yeah. So, poor old Left Shark, right? Today's YouTube birthday. Today's YouTube birthday? How old are they? 10 years. Really? 10 years ago today, the first YouTube video was posted. Oh 
And to see how much it takes a good horse just the two or three weeks, you have to have to fill back up. Right. That's the time which goes. Uh, your window is much smaller than a room horse. Uh, if you're saying, okay, let's work on a visual campaign, let's work on something that's going to have six months in terms of legs. Nowadays, you may say, no, hopefully we'll have six days. We may have six hours. Uh, really, it's reset what's expected. Highly effective. Um, did anybody have to come back around with it again? If they did it, they came back to you? I did. I was I was early. I got I was, my son or a friend of mine challenged me. Actually it was Julie that challenged me. You were Julie was in Julie and Rudd I worked with. Um, you were in the first week and a half of it. Um, and it moved from there. In fact, I'm like, what is this thing? Right? Somebody cautioned me that that was a scam. And my son uh, convinced me to do it and then the video he shot didn't work. So we had to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, that was on.
Jimmy Fallon is a big beer cat user. Right? This, uh, he broadcasts their rehearsals. You go into the writer's room, and it gives you a perspective you don't see otherwise. Um, how this is going to end up being used on a corporate, on a nonprofit basis is still up in the air. It's early on. There's a lot in here right now that is people just playing, pulling around, trying to figure out the technology. It's a sandbox environment. That's part of the fun as well. Um, Julia, are you actually getting any comments? Is anybody even following from the world out there? I just stopped it, but um, yeah, we had nine viewers. Nine viewers. I did something with RIT the other night and just purposely started, I think I was meerkatting for a conference on, it wasn't even a conference, it was a student group meeting on career strategies. And I was actually doing it just to show them. I had 29 followers. And actually people asking me questions to ask the presenter mm -hmm. from around the world. Right? They found the feed, they came in, they started making rude comments about the presenter, <laughs> about the food that was on the table. <laughs> um, I'm not kidding you. Right? I'm like, this is fun to watch. And then two or three of them actually got into it and said, hey, could you pass on along this question? Uh, <coughs> how, how it's going to be used to get the juries out, but uh, a lot of opportunity. So, that also brings me to this point. Privacy is changing. The concept of privacy. If I can have you on camera at any time, what do we need to do in terms of privacy? Uh, what restrictions do we need to put in place? What cautions do we need to put in place? How do we act? Um, how do we communicate ourselves? And how do we make sure we're doing so? <coughs> Let's say I went into East Mall tonight and found these four teen girls sitting at a table uh, and went up and asked each of them to show me what was on their phone in terms of the last photos they took. Or better yet, pull their Snapchat accounts up and show me, you know, what had just come in. What do you think they did? They come all Either <laughs> and that and that's you know, and both answers are right. We're at that stage right now where you have some groups who are like, oh, that's pretty normal. I think they'd show me if I came and asked them virtually. But if I have a forty-something-year-old man come up and ask me the mall, get a mall cop, mall bar, be there on the street right away. I'd be running out, you know, through the through the through the streets of uh, Victor. Um, but what you're seeing though is you're actually seeing some brands. Some organizations forget that and ask teens, ask others to say, hey, show me this, right? We're all sharing. We talked about sharing and shifting power, but also forgetting that they don't want to share everything, right? Consumers don't want to share every photo, perhaps every bit. Um, you still have to treat people as individuals. We had an example of that, we see you might remember, Becoming Magazine, where one of our alums opened her corner. Her mother sent this photo in which she lifted off a Facebook page. It was her profile picture. And then the magazine was printed and I got this phone call from her, this terrible voicemail, where she was very upset and wanted to know why we had lifted this picture from her Facebook page. And we're like, we don't know where it came from, hold on, let's track it down. And we find out that it was her mom sent it in. And she, I had a conversation with her and she said, you know, that was a public photo. Yes, it was out there on Facebook, but it was mine to share and not yours. Which is absolutely right. It's not, you know, so we asked her to talk to her mom. But, um, <laughs> Dad, I really don't look like you. Well, 
sorry, not all the Facebook things you do, so therefore you do. Uh, you can take up Mark Zuckerberg, just like you take up Brooklyn's mom. Um, imagine, though, what's going to happen soon when a photo like this goes on Facebook or other platforms, and you can identify every single person in that photo. Imagine if you were in that crowd shot. Imagine if you were running a marathon, you told your boss that day, that, my gosh, that was so sick. It was terrible. You're like, hey, is that bad? Oh my gosh, that's Emily Jivietsky. Oh, she was sick. She's running a marathon in Pittsburgh. Big liar. Big liar, yeah, right? It's, it's coming. It's coming. I think these are the privacy implications that Facebook, quite honestly, is going to be wrestling with, and others who want to deploy this type of facial recognition technology. Uh, it's funny, I sent Amy a note the other night, I was scrolling Facebook, and I'm like, that looks familiar. And it was a conference she and I were at, representing the local PRSA chapter, I don't know, it was in San Francisco or Philadelphia, somewhere we've been. And it was the back of my head. And I'm like, that's me, right? I can tell from my ear. Uh, but I'm like, okay, Facebook doesn't know the back of my head yet, but sooner or later, it will, and it will identify. Um, so that is coming. And just think, be cognizant of what it's going to mean for your organizations. Think about the photos you post today. Think about the photos you posted 10 years ago or five years ago. Even on YouTube videos, where everybody is going to be identified retroactively. By the way, Facebook is doing this. They're going back to all of their photo libraries and retroactively tagging. Um, and they're not always asking permission. No, they aren't asking they permission. Stop and people are tagged. You are tagged. Yeah. Uh, so it's scary. It's scary a little bit. Well, um, they still don't know. But but think through, think through the permissions, think about making sure people know that when you're posting, they're going to have their photo up. And it's not just posting in digital, it's other platforms as well. So the visual data, we talked about um, uh, visualizations of uh, data. Um, it's also just uh, driving decision making. So what is this? Anybody know what this fun thing is? Google Glass, right? Anybody ever wear it? You did. What was your experience with it? It was, um, it took a little bit of used to, but okay. it, was, it wasn't as annoying as I thought it would be. Okay, how about the people you interacted with? Um, what do you mean, like? What, what was their experience? So you had the glasses on? You had the glasses on, right. and what was their experience talking to you? I was in a lab as a scientist. Oh, so they loved it. They were showing me what they were Okay, okay. Um, what, you, you know, I actually sat down with a uh, gentleman having a conversation with somebody else. I was at a conference in Atlanta. He turned to talk to me and he had Google Glass on. And I went into, I'm suddenly a spokesperson mode. Because everything I said, it did going to be possibly recorded. I didn't know. You know, there's no light. This is, hey, you're on or you're off. Um, it, it made me have a very different interaction with him. I think the change, though, is you're going to see this type of technology in a way that's not so apparent. That you're always going to be filmed. You're always going to be ready. Now, Google Glass has gone back into the labs. Um, it's a great Times article on why it broke, per se. Google will say they rushed it out too quick. Uh, they shouldn't have given it to consumers. They shouldn't have made it widely available. It was truly a beta uh, project. Uh, but only, only Google, in its infinite wisdom, can say Google Glass is graduated. Right? So that's what they said. It's graduated, which means we've taken it away, and we've pushed it into the lab, and it will come back out again for its debut in some future. But there's other heads-up displays out there. Uh, any idea what this is? Contact lens, right? Embedded electronics. Um, Gary Orsborn, who's uh, my former b &L colleagues, I work with Cooper Vision now, um, is going to be here with his daughter sick tonight. I'm going to have Gary speak to this a little bit uh, as an optometrist. But embedded electronics and contact lenses are very real. Um, a lot of research ongoing. Um, uh, in fact, Google itself uh, has unveiled a lens that has embedded electronics that can monitor your tear film to look at glucose levels for diabetes. Uh, it's expected to be commercialized in the next year or two. Um, imagine though when your visual displays are embedded in your lens. It's not that far away. Um, I think it's incredibly exciting. I also think it's going to cause a lot of uh, problems from a privacy perspective, uh, as we talked about earlier. Uh, but think about the opportunities. Uh, think about how you're going to be able to experience this. Uh, we're going to give you some examples of what that constant has at this point. You can think about some of the things that are here now. Uh, how many of you use Am Amazon? Yeah, pretty, pretty popular. Uh, it has an app as well as you can go on their website. Amazon has hover technology that now 
for you to shake your head. Now it knows what it is that you're looking for, so you've not only put in your search term, which might appear in your Facebook feed for forever after you've taken your, bought your whatever you need um, item, but then they also watch where you are on the page. So they can see where the, tell where your cursor is, where you linger, what you click on, um, but even just the things that you're, you're viewing and considering. There's even some thoughts out there that Facebook is able, uh, is currently tracking as you have your news feed coming in. People who you kind of stop and read there, say you don't like it, you don't engage or interact with their post, but you stop for a minute to read what it is, and then it'll serve you more of those, uh, either, either ads that are related to the topic or more information from that same trend. So some of that is here already, where it's, it, it's tracking what you're doing. But it all comes back to the eye. Um, in fact, not to scare you, but Facebook Messenger, uh, you know, seen as the devil, uh, what it collects in terms of data. Um, it collects so many data points. Uh, and not just on Messenger, but in general Facebook uses. I think it's phenomenal uh, if you use it correctly. I don't think it was the marketers of Facebook that put it in. I think it was the scientists playing, uh, throwing out among engineers. I know they probably code just to code. Uh, but there's, they probably, in fact, people will say that Facebook and some other organizations probably know more about your habits than you do. Uh, which is striking, but as organizations communicating, right, it's our job to say, okay, what do they know, how can we tap into that? So, on the visual side, uh, we're almost to kind of wrap it up here too. Um, how do you track visuals online? There's a company in Boston, Cambridge actually, a startup called Ditto. In Ditto, instead of searching the web uh, through copy-based um, approaches, uh, through characters, um, searches visually. Now, Google will do a little bit of that, right? You can search for Google uh, images by dragging it. You, know, you can drag an image into the Google search box. It will search for similar images. Try it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, scary sometimes, but a lot of fun. Drag your own photo in, and you can find out that long lost sister you never knew you had. Uh, you find out where your photo is in other places. But Ditto's trying to do the same thing. Ditto will then take your photos, take any sort of graphic, and try to provide some context around them as to intelligence. Um, it'll actually create networks. Who's linking to your photo? Who's appearing alongside your photo? Say you're a brand you know, like the Boston Bruins. Did you know that more Jenny Light drinkers have Boston Bruin photos on their pages or nearby than you know, Jenny Cream Now, I don't think either of those are true, but those are the types of searches you can start to run. Uh, even sentiment analysis, things you would typically do around copy, now you can do around photography or other things. So, we're going to play a little game here. Uh, Super Bowl. This last Super Bowl in Arizona. Did anybody go? Uh, that's okay. Okay. So, Ditto tracked the top 10 brands that got the most exposure during the Super Bowl solely from a visual perspective. And they just isolated that to Twitter. So, I need a volunteer. Come on up. Stephanie, hey. come on up. Okay, so you're going to play our Price is Right game. Any Bob Barker fans? Okay. What we're going to ask you to do, we need a little audience participation here, okay? Okay. We have the 10 brands She's ready. on the Super Bowl, okay? Thank you. Let's give it a hand for Stephanie. Stephanie. We're going to give you a few seconds, okay? We're going to give you, let's say, 20 seconds. I want you to put in order from number one to number 10, the 10 top brands visually ranked during Super Bowl. Okay, you ready? Okay, start big, biggest and best down there to the least down here. And go. She's got Skittles as number one. Audience encouragement is to be okay here. Right? No, those are different. Oh, Bud Light versus Bud. What do you think? Are you making the right choices? Help her out. 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 Right now, I'm living my Monday, my Monday morning sick at home as a kid. Watching Bob Barker. This is great. We don't need to drink care of it. Okay, Doritos are moving up. We got, we got Skittles, Pepsi, Cheetos, Doritos, Bud Light, Cannon. Oh, wait. Take it again. Go to the ground.
you think about how you can display it, you paid a lot for, you need to change it on the fly. Right? You buy real estate for a month, it could be a different message every hour, every day. And today's a little obtrusive. We've got to hold something up to it. Again, very shortly, you're not going to need to hold that device up. Oh, yeah, it's all right. It's pretty cool. I haven't seen it in Rochester, but... There's a uh, factory plan with the technology that you can do the same thing with uh, print materials, right? You hand out, say, a brochure to somebody um, or an advertisement, and you put your phone over it, and it pops all sorts of options. It makes your material, it makes your communication uh, much more rich. Um, is it gimmicky? Sure. Um, but can it work? Absolutely. Actually, Esquire um, first has been playing with their own app of S2. They have one for it. But if you're a subscriber, same thing. You put your phone over the magazine and you can suddenly see rich content. It's videos, um, it's uh, more in depth stories. Um, yeah, could you go type it in? Can you scan a barcode? Sure. Um, this just brings it forward. We used to be so focused on school and the virtual tour. Slideshow tour, going around with the 360 tours, and now I think about you know, how can we use this within schools to show prospective families where our school is like, whether it's here at the Harley School or colleges nationwide. But businesses can use this too. You can, you know, there's a lot of information out there for careers, recruitment, um, both in, in looking for the right vendor partnership opportunities, uh, whether it's other not for profits as well. There's just a lot of applications in which virtual reality can really help. So we're going to do one last video. And this kind of wraps everything up. Um, we haven't talked about. This is something that's uh, launching this week in the Shanghai Auto Show from uh, Mini, uh, owned by BMW. It's their vision in the very near future of what all of this together can be from a communication standpoint. Okay, so you're going to see how heads up displays interact with devices um, connected to the internet. Uh, you're going to see how it interacts with the car that you wouldn't expect. It's a little futuristic, a little bit. I'm going to tell you I don't share his fashion sense, as you're going to see. But um, I don't think this is too far off. In fact, it's not too far off because this isn't just a bunch of guys in a room uh, creating you know, uh, a what-if video. Uh, they're actively working with Qualcomm uh, Corporation, the chip manufacturer, uh, to bring this to life. So this is going to be about two, two and a half minutes. And I think you're actually you're really one of the first to see this. Um, and that much exposure yet.